Hallelujah. Glory to the name of the Lord our God. Hallelujah. Come on and put your hands together this morning in a spirit of celebration and bless the name of the Lord our God. God is faithful. God is just. God is holy. God is reverent. There is no God like our God. Hallelujah. Ascribe unto him the glory that's to his name. Oh, bless your name, Lord. You are the most high God. You are the holy God. You're reverend, Lord. Hallelujah. We praise your name this morning. We give you glory this morning. Hallelujah. It belongs to you, Father. All of the glory, all of the honor, all of the praise belongs to you this morning, God. Hallelujah. Every day, God, we give you praise. We give you worship. We magnify your name. Hallelujah. 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 You're excellent in all of your ways. You're excellent in all of your ways. Hallelujah. We welcome you in this place. We welcome you in our hearts, in our lives. You're welcome. You are welcome. We're here just to praise your name. Hallelujah. We're here to worship you, Lord. We pray that you'll receive our praise, receive our worship as a sweet-smelling savor in your nostrils. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Arise to your rest and be blessed by our praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I said it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. We welcome you this morning. Those of you who are in the sanctuary and those of you who are joining us online, we welcome you to our worship experience this morning and we pray and that God will be glorified. And if God is glorified, then we will be blessed. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So we welcome you today, and we, we just we want to honor God and pray that everything we do will be pleasing in His sight. Uh, we will turn to, the, to our scripture this morning, which is coming from the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 32. Following that, Minister Smalls will lead us in a praise uh, selection and Elder Fly will come and lead us in prayer following that and then we will move uh, further in the worship experience. As we're turning to the scripture, we want to remind everyone that the second Sunday of April is our 25th founding day celebration. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. And we are excited. We are excited about celebrating 25 years of ministry. Uh, we will have two services on that day and brunch in between, so let's be governed accordingly. When we're asked to do things, let's plan to do that. Bishop Kirkland Smith and New Hope will be with us, amen, on that Sunday at, at uh, 1130, 1230, at 1230. And this is the first time we have had a fellowship service in two years or so, amen. Uh, Bishop Smith assured me that that. All of them members have been vaccinated. He said, we can have in-person worship. We're all vaccinated. So, amen. I don't know if all of us are, but most of us are. Praise the name of Jesus, and we will follow our protocols as we normally do as we have a glorious time in the name of the Lord. And you will receive more instruction from that. Our scripture reading this morning from Numbers 32, beginning at verse number 1 and reading through verse 23. Actually, you could actually read the entire text, please, ma'am, and please, the entire chapter uh, when, at your leisure. Beginning at verse 1, the Reubenites and Gadites, who had very large herds and flocks, saw that the lands of Jazer and Gilead were suitable for livestock. So they came to Moses and Eleazar the priest and to the leaders of the community and said, <clears throat> Ataroth, Debon, Jezer, Nimroth, Hezbon, Elezala, Saban, Nebo, and Beon, the land the Lord subdued before the people of Israel, are suitable for livestock, and your servants have livestock. 
if we have found favor in your eyes, they said, let this land be given to your servants as our possession. Do not make us cross the Jordan. Moses said to the Gadites and Reuben and the Reubenites, should your fellow Israelites go to war while you sit here? Why do you discourage the Israelites, the Israelites from crossing over into the land the Lord has given them? This is what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to look over the land. After they went up to the valley of Eskol and viewed the land, they discouraged the Israelites from entering the land the Lord had given them. The Lord's anger was aroused that day, and he swore this oath, because they have not followed me wholeheartedly, nor not one of those who were 20 years old or more when they came up out of Egypt will see the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not one except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and the Canaanite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they followed the Lord wholeheartedly. The Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until the whole generation of those who had done evil in his sight was gone. And here you are, a brood of sinners, standing in the place of your fathers and making the Lord even more angry with Israel. If you turn away from following him, he will again leave all this people in the wilderness and you will be the cause of their destruction. Then they came up to him and said, we would like to build pens here for our livestock and cities for our ch women and children. But we will arm ourselves for battle and go ahead of the Israelites until we have brought them to their place. Meanwhile, our women and children will live in fortified cities for protection from the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until each of the Israelites have received their inheritance. We will not receive any inheritance with them on the other side of the Jordan because our inheritance has come to us on the east side of the Jordan. Then Moses said to them, If you will do this, if you will arm yourselves before the Lord for battle, and if all of you who are armed cross over the Jordan before the Lord until he's driven his enemies out before him, then when the land is subdued before the Lord, you may return and be free from your obligation to the Lord and to Israel. And this land will be your possession before the Lord. But if you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord, and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. Build cities for your women and children, and pens for your flocks, but do what you have promised. Amen. That sends the reading of the word of the Lord. Continue to read that chapter. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everyone. Hallelujah. I just want to praise you forever and ever and ever. Saints and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me. I just want to thank you. Oh. 
just want to praise you forever and ever and ever for all you've done for me. Come on and sing with me. Blessings and glory. to God. Father, we give you praise and we give you glory. God, we thank you for this great and glorious day. This is a day we've never seen before. We'll never see this day again. But in the remaining hours of this day, we'll magnify, extol, and exalt you because you alone are worthy. God, we thank you for this house. We thank you for the head of this house, God. We thank you for every man, woman, and child that's under the sound of my voice. God, we thank you. We just want to thank you, Father God, for allowing us together again. Father, we just praise you. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that our hearts are ready to hear the word. God, we thank you for your word will go forth and not return unto you void. It will accomplish what you sent it to do. Now, Father, we give you praise and we give you glory. God, we thank you that what we hear today, God, we'll give it to the people outside of this house. 
you. God will magnify you as we leave this place to serve. In Jesus' name, amen, and glory to God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Can we say that together? In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Just begin to call on the name of the Lord today. Just call his name. Hallelujah, in your name, Father. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. I've had some good days. I've had some hills to climb. I've had some weary days. And some sleepless nights. But when I, I look around and I think things all over, all of my good days, they outweigh my bad days. I won't complain. Sometimes the clouds, they hang low. I can barely see the road. I ask the question, why, Lord? Why there's so much pain, oh, but God knows what's best for me, even when my weary eyes, they cannot see, so I'll say thank you, Lord. I, I won't complain. God's been so good to me. Hallelujah. He's been so very good to me. More than this world could ever be. God's been good to me. Oh, oh, oh. He's dried all my tears away. Turn my midnights into day So I'll say thank you, Lord I, I won't complain Because you see God So good to me more than this world or anyone could ever be God's been good God's been good to me
to look at our situations and our circumstances and complain and wonder why things happen. But we have to come to the place where we say, I won't complain. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In the book of Numbers 32, chapter 32, let's turn there as we go into the word this morning. Ah, oh, thank you, Jesus. Numbers 32, beginning at verse number 1 and reading through verse number 5. The Reubenites and Gadites, who had very large herds and flocks, saw that the lands of Jezer and Gilead were suitable for their livestock. So they came to Moses and Eleazar the priest 
and to the leaders of the community and said, Ataroth, Debon, Jezer, Nimrah, Hezbon, Elaroth, Elalah, Sabam, Nebo, and Beon, the land the Lord subdued before the people of Israel, are suitable for livestock. And your servants have livestock. If we have found favor in your eyes, they said, let this land be given to your servants as our possession. Do not make us cross the Jordan. Hallelujah. I want to talk about the battle between man's desire and God's design. The battle between man's desire and God's design. So, Father, thank you for this opportunity to come this morning in this holy place to proclaim your holy word. I pray for a fresh anointing of your spirit to rise upon me now so that I might minister this word as you've given it and minister it under your anointing so that yokes will be destroyed and burdens removed from our lives. Thank you, Father, that your promise is that when your word goes forth, it does not return to you void. It accomplishes what you desire. And you prosper your word in the things that you sent your word to. Thank you for preparing our hearts to receive your word this morning. Thank you for what your word will accomplish in our lives. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. The battle between man's desire and God's design. Hallelujah. History bears up the fact that human beings have, have desires and reasonings, if you will, uh, of our own that we tend to follow regardless of what God has said. Amen. Amen. I want to repeat that statement just in case somebody missed it. History bears up the fact that human, being, human beings have desires and reasonings or logic of our own that we tend to follow regardless of what God has said. Those of us in the faith many times, even, even many times those of us in the faith, tend to challenge God's authority. Hmm and challenge God's design because it seems, because it does not or may not seem logical to us or may not fit in to what we think is best for ourselves. In fact, the ways of the Lord, his design, his design, seems illogical to many human beings. However, God's design, God's will, God's ways are always best and works out for our good if we will follow his design. The Bible is replete with examples of this. Take Jericho, for instance. And I won't go through the whole scenario because most of us know the story of Jericho. If you don't, go back and read it. God's direction to Joshua in conquering Jericho didn't make sense in the natural to, 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 to human beings. It just was not military strategy. It wasn't logical military strategy. But it worked. It worked. God says, tell the people of Israel to march around the wall one time a day. Get the, the, the leaders, the, uh, the elders, and have them blow, the, have them with that ram's horn, and on, on the ram's horn, and on the seventh day, march around seven times. All of this time, you're not saying a word. We just finished singing, I won't complain. But that's not our tendency. Our tendency is to complain. Many times before we even think about it, we're complaining about situations. So 
You know, it's not, it's not human nature not to complain. Think about the last time you complained. Somebody cut you off while you were driving. Oop, something happened that you didn't like. Well, why are y'all laughing? <laughs> uh, it's real, right? Many times we complain without even thinking about it because that's the natural way we do things. That seems to be natural. Can somebody say natural? Mm. Lord, have mercy for natural. <laughs> have mercy, mercy upon us. Yeah, we complain at home. You know, we complain about our children. We complain about our spouses. We complain about this. We complain about that. We complain about the other. Some of us are just natural complainers. Our parents were natural complainers, so we inherited that, that, that trait. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. God's strategy worked. He said, don't utter a word. Can you imagine these people marching around the wall of Jericho for seven days? And the command is, don't utter a word. Brother Bowell would have been saying, I'm listening. <laughs> don't utter a word. <laughs> Amen. But it worked. On the seventh day, the seventh time around, they were given the order to blow the ram's horn and let out a big shout, and the walls fell down flat. They didn't do anything else. God did it. God's strategy worked. Muslims and probably other faith groups cannot understand the concept of a God who takes on human flesh and is crucified in order to redeem mankind. It doesn't make sense to them. It's not logical. But it happened, and it worked. It fulfilled God's plan because it was God's desire. Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, was God's way of satisfying the righteous requirement of his law. All right? Uh, that he had instituted so that he could justly, so he could legally provide salvation for all mankind. Romans 3 and 26 says, he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So, so things that God does may not seem logical to us, but it's God's world and it's God's design that really matters. What God did in Christ, his design for the salvation of the human race was illogical to human beings. However, what God did opened up the way for you and me and everyone else who will come to faith in Christ to be saved. So this battle, this battle between God's design and man's desires and logic didn't start yesterday. It's been going on. You know, if you just, you know, over the last couple of days, for the longest, well, well, that doesn't necessarily apply. So over the last couple of days, you know, I've been thinking about some situations and circumstances that, that, that happen and how people respond to things. And I, I saw on a, on a Facebook post that, that one of our members posted, somebody challenged her in what she said, and, 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 and what she said was true, was very true uh, and correct and right because she was dealing with God's design. But if you don't understand God's design and you don't understand that God has the right because he's sovereign to design his world and his people in the way that he chooses to do and to set up his standards, you will never accept God's design. And if you leave Satan out of the picture, which means that you leave evil out and you leave perverted ways and perverted thoughts and the perverted will of man out of the picture and you just think it's you and God, then, then you're totally off base and you'll never come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, I said that without dealing with some specifics that might have helped, but just get this thought of God's design. And the battle between man's desire 
man, what I want to do. All right? Every human being gets in this battle between what I want to do and what God has designed. Yeah, there's a battle. That, and you know what? <laughs> uh, uh, God is not the issue. God is not the problem. We're the problem. We're warring against God. We have sided with evil. We have sided with Satan, and we are warring against God. And I know, you know, people don't want to think of the evilness of this, and that, that's a broad statement without sitting down and really thinking about the context of all of this, but it is the truth. We side with evil while saying that we are good. Well, anyway, let me go on with this. Yeah, yeah. Satan is behind all of this. So let me say here that if we are going to participate, you know, and all of this ties into us as God's people completing the task, if we're going to participate in this process of completing the task uh, of testifying to the gospel of God's grace in our generation, okay, this is not for what God has assigned to his body in 2022, and as long as we live, uh, is for our generation. We have to trust God that his design for our lives and for his creation is the right way and the right thing. Paul was unwavering in uh, his determination, just like Jesus was, going to the cross. Uh, Isaiah prophesied that he set his face like flint. Flint is a hard rock. And he's saying that Jesus was, 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 was unwavering in his determination to go to the cross and be crucified to satisfy the purpose of him coming into this world. That's the same way Paul was when even other believers tried to dissuade him. Holy Spirit said, testified in every city that he went in that if you go to Jerusalem, imprisonment and afflictions are waiting on you. Paul said, none of these things bother me. I'm going to Jerusalem yeah, to fulfill this divine destiny. And as I said now, now the problem is not with God. The problem is with us. Think about Moses. And I was reading this in a devotion on the other day when Moses went up on the Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. All right. Moses ascended up on Mount Sinai to meet with God. Just like Moses ascended up, you and me have to ascend up to meet with God and God's standards. Okay. okay. God is not down below us. Well, he has to send up to meet with us and to meet our standard and our way of thinking. We got to get that picture. God is supreme. He is the most high God. He is not beneath us. He is above us. And if we are going to, to be a part of him and his, his will and his way, we ascend up to God to become like him. He never becomes like us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Isaiah bears this up in Isaiah 58, 55, 8 and 9. God says to the prophet Isaiah, for, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts than your thoughts and my ways than your ways. Amen. He's higher. He's higher. He, set, he has set a standard. He has a design that he's already put in place. Now, remember, God is not in the business of remodeling or renovating his plans and his design. He's not in that business. God's design is set. He says, I am God. I change not, or I do not change. Mm. And saints, we got to realize that God's design is always best. He knows what we don't know. 
He sees what we don't see. He can do what we can't do. If we would only listen, and somebody say listen. If we would only listen, learn, and apply, we will come out better for it in the long run. Can somebody say in the long run? Ooh, I heard a lady say one time, I read a story, I was reading this article, she said, if I had known I was going to live as long as I lived, I would have taken better care of myself when I was younger. The long run makes a difference. What you do now will tell a story later on in your life. Mm. His ways are best. His ways are best. Amen. Uh, and, and if we would listen, if we would learn, if we would apply, we'll come out better for it, and we will find ourselves participating with God in fulfilling his mission on earth, which is really the only reason you exist. Amen. I don't know if we'll ever get that, if many people will ever get that, that the reason that you exist is to fulfill God's purposes and plans for your life that impact his creation. Amen. You're not here just for yourself. Sometimes we act like we're here just for ourselves. It's my life. I live it the way I want to live it. I do what I want to do. But you're totally off, off base. Totally off base. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our text for today gives us uh, or deals with this issue of, of this battle, this battle between man's desire uh, and God's design. And when we examine this text, we see a prime example of what's called situation ethics. Situation, situation ethics deals with what people deem is right in the situation. Let me just give you a, a more specific definition. Situation ethics considers only the particular context of an act when evaluating it ethically. Ethics deal with what's right and what's wrong. The situation determines what's right and what's wrong. Rather than judging it according to absolute moral standards, when we deal with absolute moral standards, there are people in this world that say there are no absolutes. Well, if you're saying there are no absolutes, you're saying there is no God. Because God is absolute. He is the sovereign God. He has set a standard. He has a design that supersedes anything that Satan may design, or if we don't want to say Satan, that man may design. He supersedes it all. He's sovereign. In other words, what happens in situation ethics is that, that we allow the situation to guide us in the decision-making process in determining whether a particular decision or action is right or wrong rather than God's moral law. Now, if you don't know God's moral law, then you have nothing to to, 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 to measure your decision-making by. So you measure it by other people. That's why people will say, well, I'm just as good as the next man. But, but the next man is not your, your, your standard of measurement. Jesus is your standard of measurement. Amen. So, you know, we get into this comparison between people and what people do, and we take our eyes away from God. And, you know, I can understand people who don't know God doing this. But people who have claimed Jesus as Savior and Lord, we, we, we don't need to be doing that. We need to make sure that we understand Christ's will and Christ's way so that we're always measuring ourselves by him and not by people or not by the world standard, you know, or not by human philosophy or human logic. You know, the problem with a lot of us is that we don't know the Lord. We accepted Jesus, but we haven't taken time to get to know him. That's a, that's a big issue in the body of Christ. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> I was reading this the other day, and the man said that something to the effect that, 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 that uh, you know, people in their relationship with Christ are like an old iron bed. It's strong on both ends, but it's sagging in the middle. What did he mean by that? <laughs> We get saved, and we focus on going to heaven. Yeah. In the middle, we're sagging. 
Our faith is not strong. Our knowledge of the word is not strong. Our knowledge of God is not strong. Our participation in the things of God is not strong. We're just sagging. And we find all kinds of reasons not to do because our faith is not sagging. I mean, our faith is sagging. I mean, not sagging. It's sagging. A whole lot of people just sagging. Just weak. We, we can't face situations and circumstances because our faith is not strong in the middle where it matters. It matters in the middle. Can somebody say it matters in the middle? When you're going through things, your faith matters. When you're being challenged by the devil, your faith matters. When you're being tempted by the enemy, your faith matters. When you have to make decisions, amen, uh, uh, about life and living and the things you do, amen, your faith really matters. You can't be guided by the situation. Hmm. So let's learn from this text today so we can avoid making, prayerfully making the same mistakes that these tribes of, of, of Reuben, Gad, and later on it's mentioned a half-tribe of Manasseh. And if you don't know why it's the half-tribe of Manasseh, it's because God gave Joseph inheritance in the land, two of his sons. He gave them inheritance in Israel. Okay. Now, now this is critical, and, and, and I'm going to just kind of like hopefully stay at this level, so I hope I don't put you asleep this morning, because this, this passage is not one of those hooping passages. Okay, it's not one that you're going to get really excited over, but you need to take time and look at it and learn. Learn from this passage, because when you read this at face value, and I've read this passage many a times, and I miss some things in this passage, Okay. So this is really, really critical that there are things in here you don't miss because it seems like the decision that they make is okay. All right. So we're going somewhere in this because a lot of times it seems like the decisions we make are okay. All right. But there's always, there's always a point that makes it not okay. All right. All right. All right. So let's, let's pay attention to this. So here's the situation in a nutshell. All right? The Israelites are preparing to go into the, the promised land. All right? Right? The promised land. Everybody knows, most of us know what the promised land is. The, this is the land that God promised to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Abraham and his descendants. This promise is reiterated over and over again. Uh, it is reaffirmed with, with Isaac, it's reaffirmed with Jacob. It's for their descendants. God, they were not a people, but God chose them, chose Abraham, called Abraham out from among his descendants, and made a covenant with Abraham, promised Abraham that his seed will be greater than the sands of the sea, and from his seed all nations of the earth would be blessed. All right, now, now God will fulfill his covenant, and God did fulfill his promise to Abraham. But in the middle, somebody say in the middle. In the middle, some bad things happen. And this, this also is a picture of salvation because Jesus has provided salvation for everybody. But in the process, everybody doesn't accept. So everybody's not going to heaven because there's only one way to go to heaven. I don't care if a person dies and you love them with all your heart and pre the preacher preaches that person's going to heaven, you're going to see them again. Some people you're only going to see if they go to hell and you go to hell. If they haven't received, haven't received Jesus as Savior and Lord and you are saved, you're not going to see them in heaven. I don't care how much you love them. I don't care what people say to try to comfort you. You are not going to see. If they died outside of Jesus, they are not going to heaven. You may not like it, but again, that's what? God's design. And God is not remodeling the salvation process just to get your loved one into heaven or my loved one into heaven. Sometimes we say things to try to make people feel good, but... The truth is, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. It's Jesus. Yeah, yeah. So, the Israelites are preparing to enter the promised land. 
on the way, they wage war with other nations. And we know the story. If you follow the Exodus and you follow them preparing to go into the promised land, they wage war. In particular, right before this incident, they've waged war with the Amorites and the Midianites. Amen. They have a miraculous battle against the Midianites. They inherit the spoils of the battle. Okay? All right? Uh, and so they are getting rich. They're getting richer. Remember, they went into slavery poor. God brought them out rich, but they are getting richer as they go. Now, this, 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 this does not speak to the name it and claim it philosophy of our day, that you're going to get rich just because you name it and claim it. They had to fight for their riches. They had to fight for their riches. But God, they, they got the spoils. So, so... Uh, and they come into a lot of land, a lot of sport. And when the Bible talks about livestock, it's dealing with cattle, it's dealing with, with, with donkeys, it's dealing with sheep, it's dealing with goats. Livestock. They even get gold and silver. Whatever the people had that they conquered, they took for themselves, the spoils of the battle. And, of course, they dedicated some of it to the Lord. They gave it to the Lord and to the Lord's temple. Amen? Amen. All right. To make this short, and let's pay attention to the moves of the text. Now, we read the, Gadite, the Reubenites and the Gadites, who had very large herds and flocks, saw that the land of Jezer and Gilead was suitable for livestock. The Hebrew text does not state it like that. So in your study, and then, of course, most of us don't read Hebrew, so you got to study. That's why Paul said, study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So I called a couple of people as I was preparing this because I don't read Hebrew. Of course, I use my commentary, and I saw what it said in the commentary. Pay close attention. English-speaking people, English Bible readers, pay close. You got to study. The Hebrew text doesn't state it like that. It doesn't start with the Reubenites and the Gadites. The Hebrew text starts with so livestock. So livestock. Note, the Hebrew text does not start with so the instruction from the Lord. That's key. That's key. Because we're starting with so livestock. This is an indication that livestock was the basis of their request. Well, let's, let's, let's go a little bit further than livestock. That personal wealth, that personal uh, 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 prosperity, that personal uh, aspirations or what have you, was the basis of their request, not God's instructions. So they didn't come to Moses from the vantage point of what God had said. They did not come to Moses from the vantage point of God's design. They came to Moses from the vantage point of what would benefit them. Somebody else should have said amen. Because what do we do? We come to God. God bless me. God bless my family. God, I need this. God, I need that. God, give me this. Many times for a lot of people, our focus is not on God. It's not on God's design. Okay? You know why we get all emotional on some of the songs that we sing in the church? Because they focus on us. <laughs> it's good to talk about I won't complain. But you got to learn not to complain. What does that song focus on? And we will shout off a I won't complain. And we will get emotional and cry and, and sometimes... Some people in some church jump over bitches about, I've been, I've, been good, I've been going through this and I've been going through that. But the focus should be on God has been good to me. That's where the focus should be, not on what I've been going through. It's no secret that we're going to go through stuff. The Lord has told us that we're going to go through things. But we tend to focus on us, on what we want. They came to Moses with a request 
that focused on what they wanted, what would benefit them. So livestock, not so the word of the Lord says, so lost master. Their request was selfish. Their request was short-sighted, self-centered, with no consideration of God's intended purpose or God's intended design. Are y'all following me? All right. This God who chose Abraham, who said to, made a promise and a covenant with Abraham, and who's worked diligently to fulfill this covenant promise, to bring them into the land of promise. They get to the Jordan River. The borders of the land of promise start on the west side of the Jordan, not the east side of the Jordan. You hear today, when they talk about Israel, they talk about the West Bank. So the east side of Jordan was not a part of the promised land. But what did they see? They saw fertile land. They saw grass. They saw plains. They saw water. Well, so they have plenty of livestock, and it seems so logical. Have you ever looked at a situation, and it seems so logical? See, this, this is, and God has subdued these people, so this must be God. It must be God. But they weren't thinking about, really, they weren't thinking about it must be God. They were looking at the livestock, and they were looking at the land. If we have this land on this, we don't know what's on the other side of Jordan. Mind you, they've not gone into Jordan, but they still have God's promise. Now, that speaks against that old saying, a bird, how did that thing go? And I thought about it this morning. <laughs> a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush or something like that. You know, you got one, you get that one, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. But the, 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 the thing about it is, is that a bird in the hand is not, is not better than having God in faith if, and having the promises of God because God has promised to take them into a land that is abundantly supplied, that is flowing, as the Scripture says it like this, flowing, uh, that is, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Well, well, we'll just leave it at milk and honey. That's flowing with milk and honey. Abundantly supplied. Yeah. These people, they forget about God's intended design. They forget about their fellow tribesmen. They're not thinking about the rest of the tribes. This is a 12-tribe federation. These people have been together. These are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now you have two and a half of them who forget about everybody else. Kind of reminds me of, of, of Peter and John when, when they were dealing with Jesus. Master, when you come into your kingdom, now here are 12, we are 12 disciples. And, 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 and so they get, they get to Jesus and they, they're talking to Jesus. When you come into your kingdom, let one of us sit on your left side and the other on your right side. We know there are 10 others. But we're not concerned about those 10 others. We're just concerned about us. Are y'all getting the picture here? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 they're only concerned about themselves. Uh, there's no vision for an even greater opportunity that may lay ahead of them in the promised land. So, that means that they don't trust God. They don't trust God's promises. And that they don't trust the fact that the God who gave the promise is able to fulfill that promise. They're not concerned about the unity of the nation. They're not concerned about any of that. They're only concerned about themselves. You see, right here, the seed is planted. Right here, the seed is planted for disunity and the destruction of the nation right here. What do you mean? They, a seed is planted. Well, think about it. Think about it. During the time of the judges, get past Joshua. 
And during the time of the judges, their division arises in the, in the land. After Solomon's death, the nation is divided. Now, see, a lot of times we don't think about the long-range consequences. And, of course, we can't see beyond these walls. But we have to think in terms of what may happen down the road. The, the, Lord, the Lord gives us wisdom so it kind of put parameters around what we decide. And keeps us in line with seeking his face and trusting his will and his way. God has a way. There's an old saying that says, don't move the fence unless you know what it was there for. In our society today, we're moving a lot of fences without, without considering what the fence was put up for. We are throwing away the word of the Lord. We're saying that the word of the Lord is, does not apply to this generation. Situational ethics. That's what's happening in the world. When you have seminaries who are going back, rewriting the Bible, rewriting the Scriptures, and taking out certain things that tend to be offensive to people, you're moving a fence without knowing what it was there for. And you're only considering present situations and present circumstances. Does, don't we realize that this world existed before we came into being? Why did God place you in a family? He didn't just recreate, recreate, recreate. There is, that, 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 there is a lineage that comes along. So you are not a person unto yourself. You are in the context of family. You are in the context of ancestral family. You are in the context, glory to God, of a nation. You are in the context of a God who created this world. Now I can say what I started to say earlier. It's been troubling me, troubling me, troubling me about Ukraine. And I was just praying, Lord, it got to be, why is this man doing what he's doing? Now, 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 I'm not justifying what Putin is doing. But the other day, I came across a video that was done six years ago. Six years ago, when the United States and Europe were trying to bring Ukraine into the Western Hemisphere, making them a part of West. Putin said, this will not happen. If you, do, if you proceed with this, I will destroy Ukraine. Six years ago. So this just didn't start. And I was thinking, and that's why I posted on, on Facebook, those of you all who read it, context makes all of the difference in the world. So what these people should have been thinking about was context. Yes, you're here. Yes, this land is it's, 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 it's fertile. Yes, you have livestock, but what's the context of your situation? You don't make a decision based on where you are right here, right now, that only satisfies you. Because when you do that, you are in direct opposition to God's design. They were in direct opposition of God's design because God had designed the promised land. The promised land had boundaries. Uh, go Google it. Google the promised land. You'll see the boundaries. I mean, you, may, you may have to read to understand some of it, but you'll see the boundaries. Now, notice what they said to Moses. They said to Moses, do not make us cross the Jordan. Don't make us cross over. So now, literally, because you see what happens when you read on in this text, they make a compromise. They, they, Moses really rebukes them sternly. Yeah, he... he <laughs> uh, uh, he rejects their request because in their heart, you see, a lot of this stuff is, is heart issues. That's why the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. We can't know our hearts. We can't know it. Only God can. So Moses rebukes them sternly, all right? But the thing about it is that they have, they're in direct opposition to God's design. They don't want to go into the promised land. I'm satisfied right here. I'm happy right here. I don't want anything else. I don't see anything else. I don't know anything else. I don't know what's across the Jordan River. I don't know what we're going to have to face. And Moses, Moses rebukes them. He really calls them a brood of sinners. And I'm not going to go through all of this today. But he talks about how when they got ready to, uh, when he sent the spies to spy out the promised land, that 12 people, that 10 people came back with an evil report. 
and how God punished Israel for rejecting him and rejecting his word. You see, it's just not a matter of not doing this. It's a matter of rejecting God's design. Can somebody say rejecting God's design? And if you reject God's design, you reject God. That's the whole issue. They were rejecting God. So then they come back in verse 16. Then they came up to him and said, that's a way of saying, we're, we, we, we're going to come near to Moses. We're going to negotiate. Because what, 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 what Moses has said, he's rejected them flatly. This is not going to happen. They don't want to go, but Moses, the leader, is saying, this is not going to happen. How many people want to negotiate these days? I don't see it that way. Mm. Why does it have to be that way? Remember, God is not in the business of remodeling and renovating. What God has fixed stands. So they negotiate with Moses. I'm, I'm going to wrap this up because this is, the, this is a very key point that we need to get. They negotiate with Moses, and Moses agrees. Where do you read in this text that Moses and the leaders consulted God? You don't read it anywhere in the text where they consulted God. Moses agrees. They make a compromise. You say, well, Moses is God's leader. So, so God has to do what Moses says. God doesn't have to do what Moses says. Nowhere in this text where Moses or Eliezer or any of the leaders consulted God. Moses said to them, if you will do this. Now, now, how many people do what they actually say they're going to do? You know, some of us, the Lord has, has helped us along the way, and we do our very, very best. But a lot of times, people just don't do what they say they're going to do. Now, the Lord has given us a task and an assignment. It's imperative that we do what we say we're going to do. Moses agreed. The point here is, people will argue the point. Well, if Moses agreed with them, and Moses said, Moses even goes on to say, if you will arm yourselves, be, uh, uh, so, so this is the agreement. Because the issue was, we're going to stay on this side of the Jordan. But they have to conquer the promised land. Now, you're going to separate yourself and divide yourself from the rest of the tribes. No, this is not going to happen because we have to conquer this promised land. So they agree for 40,000 of their troops to go into battle. That's not all of their troops. Now, remember, they want to set up their towns and their villages uh, on the east side of Jordan. So troops have to be left behind to protect those that are on the east side of Jordan. All you got to do is go, well, I shouldn't say all you have to do. You got to go back and read and then you discover the number of troops that were left behind and the numbers that went with them to fight the battle. So they said, we'll go and we will not return home until all of our brethren have received their inheritance. And they do what they say they're going to do when you read further on. That's an issue. That's an issue. God's design. That's the point. God's design. And God doesn't change his design for anybody. For anybody. I don't care who agrees. You may come to me about an issue that, 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 that you disagree with, and you may argue your point. And I may say, okay, well, you argued your point. Well, we'll do it this way. But the issue is always God's design. And people have a problem with God's design. So we get into the discussion of God's perfect will and God's permissive will. When you talk about permissive will, what are you talking about? You're talking about the fact that God will permit things to happen because you and me have been created in the image and likeness of God, which means that we are free moral agents. We have a right to make decisions. We can do it. He gave us free will. But there are consequences to the decisions that we make. There are side effects. There are after effects to many of the decisions that we make, especially if we make those decisions that don't go according to God's design. 
So Moses agreed with them. Moses said, okay, if you do this, he gave them provisional, he gave them this provisional land grant, land grant in the Transjordan. Transjordan just, just means across Jordan. Always remember when you read this, that's not the promised land. That's not according to God's design. And Moses agrees. Well, you say, well, Moses is at fault too. Well, maybe he was. It doesn't matter who was at fault. The point is, it's against God's design. It's permitted. It's permitted. Don't forget everything that leads up to this. A seed, a seed of division, a seed of disunity has been planted. They're going against God's design. They don't want what God, the sovereign God, has put in place for them. Even though it's permitted, there are consequences that happen. This battle, this battle that many of us are in with what we want, with what our desire is, as opposed to what God's will, God's design is. Saints, we're not going to win it. We won't win this battle. Not only will we not win it, but our children, our children's children, and our children's children's children will suffer the consequences. Oh, you said what the Bible says, that, 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 that the sins of the father would not, would not, would not be charged against their children. may not be charged against them. But there is something about generational stuff that happens in our lives. You know why people complain? They were brought up in a house of complainers. We've, in, we've inherited the sin of Adam. We have a sin nature. Thank God for Jesus that we can be forgiven of our sins. But think of the number of people who don't want to accept Jesus and still reject him. So what we want to do is we want to discover God's original design and we want to follow God's original design because God doesn't change and God doesn't negotiate. His way is his way. God doesn't need you in heaven. He doesn't need me in heaven. He wants me to be there. He wants you to be there. But he doesn't need us. If he needed Satan and the third of the angels that rebelled and were cast out of heaven without any means of repentance, if he needed them, he would have made it possible for them to repent. I know this is kind of a sobering message, and maybe I didn't communicate it the way I really wanted to communicate it, but this thing really just, just set in my spirit uh, the other day, and I began to read this and study this, and I said, wow, this is what's happening. Throughout the world, the church is compromising. Believers are compromising. We're saying, God, your way is not good enough for this generation. This generation needs more. This generation needs something else. This may not be the truth. It may not be the actual case. I was talking to one of our ministers the other day. We were talking about a particular situation. And I said, you know, this ministry has a solid foundation. We work at, regardless of what has happened, you know, and sometimes people don't understand context because it's more than one situation. All right. But the foundation of this ministry is solid. We work at teaching the Word of God. 
I said, you know, and I was, I said, you know, this particular person, I just wish he had stayed so he could get a solid foundation because he's off base. He said, Bishop, people are looking for excitement. People are looking for excitement. They're not looking for a solid foundation. I knew a long time ago how to grow this church in a country town. All I had to do was develop my hoop and come in here every Sunday and pour it out. Get the, get the minister music on the keyboard. You all remember the days we would turn over chairs. When we started, we couldn't keep chairs straight. We set chairs up, and before the service was over, every chair in the place would turn over. We were like a bunch of crazy folk. We got free. And, but the Lord said, that's not going to get it. You got to teach people. You got to make disciples of people. He said, Bishop, people like excitement. And black people in particular. I shouldn't say it like that. But that's, how, that's a part of our DNA. It is. Now, all of us who like to hear the word taught, when we get in one of those services, when the tune is real good, you can see us rocking. You can see us swaying. I was listening to a song yesterday on, 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 on YouTube, uh, popped up in a, in a video. And I'll tell you what, when they started moving, they're old singing now. And some, of you, some of you all young people don't know the, the real, real, real old good stuff. And that choir started singing, and they were singing this song about... Uh, about redemption or what have you. I don't remember that. And man, they got to the point, and I saw this old lady stand up. And I knew this lady. She dead and gone on with the life. I never saw her stand up and sing. And, she, and when she stood up and started singing, something quickened in my spirit. And I was driving, and I almost wanted to stop. So that, that's something that, that we really like. But many times, I think about Jesus. And how he taught his disciples and prepared them so that they could teach others. And Paul said, the things that I've committed to you, commit to faithful men that they may teach others. So for those who just really want excitement, you may not find excitement over here, but I guarantee you'll find a healthy menu. And you'll get healthy in the Lord, and you'll be able to build up others, make disciples of others. That's the goal, saints. The goal is to win others, and we have to go back to God's design and not have a people who are just coming to worship for excitement, but have people that want to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we have work to do in ourselves because we can get into what we want, what we like, you know. But we have to get out of that, go back to God's design. This battle is raging. It's raging. It's raging throughout the land between what man wants, what man's desire, what, I, what we want, what our desire is, what we think is right, and what God has said in his word. His design does not change. And even if compromise is made and it seems like it's the right thing to do, God doesn't change his design. And there will be consequences for those of us who choose to follow God's son. I was reviewing this message this morning, and, 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 I, and I thought about this. This would have been a good topic preach, but it wasn't related to people. Don't live in Transjordan. Some people want to live in trans. You don't want the promises of God. You want to be close enough to the promises. You'll even set up an altar. Now, just read the account because they almost got killed. They set up this big altar at the Jordan. I'm talking about the tribes of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And when the other Israelites saw it, they were preparing for war. They said, let's go, let's kill them all. Let's wipe them out. Now, you know, it's your American way of thinking. That's why, that's why the Western people, you know, they don't think like we think. 
you know, we're always merciful and kind, and, you know, we want to, yeah, we should be. Okay. Putin doesn't think that's why he's wiping out Ukraine. It doesn't make it right. All right. But when there is a commitment to God, these are God's people. And the rest of the tribes thought that they were going to separate themselves and set up an altar where they could worship God on the east side of Jordan. Now, God says, I was, there's one place that you worship. God was not considering your sacrifices that you have to make. There's a sacrifice you got to make. And they were going to go back and kill them. They were going to wipe out the, the two tribes of Israel and the half tribe of Manasseh until the Lord touched their hearts and they decided to find out what they did. Saints, oh, somebody wrote a song, wrote a sermon long, I think it's Wigglesworth. Wigglesworth. It's a da it, dangerous thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. There are consequences. There are consequences. God has mercy, but there are consequences. In this battle, between what we want, our desire, our will, our way, and God's design, if we get nothing else from this message, get the fact that God's design does not change. He's granted us grace and mercy in Christ, but that doesn't take away the consequences. There may not be eternal consequences, but there are consequences that happens along the way in life. The results of our decisions. God have mercy on us. God have mercy on us. Let's stand. The Lord is preparing us for a greater work, a deeper work, a more effective work. No different from what he's designed already. And he wants all of us to be a part of it. We're not saved just to go to heaven. There was a mission that the Israelites were on. That mission was to take possession of the promised land. Two and a half tribes didn't want to participate. You look at it closely, it's almost like their arms were twisted to participate, and they did. God should never have to twist our arms. He should never have to threaten us to do his will. When we realize God's faithfulness and we realize the great love that he has for us and all that he's done to bring us within the boundaries of his will and his way, to save us, to make us a part of his eternal plan for this world that we live in, we should be thankful. And we should humbly submit. If, if, we, if we struggle, our desire should always be to submit. If there is a struggle along the way, have the desire to submit. Lord, help me. You can be honest with the Lord. Lord, I'm struggling at this point. God, help me. God will help you. But your heart has to be in the right place. Don't just surrender and say, I'm, my will is, is the right way. My, what, I, what I see, what I understand, what's better for me is what's best. It's all about me, mine, what I want, what I want to do, where I want to go. You know, a lot, of, a lot of times I think about decisions that people make that even affect ministry.
And my decision, my decision to stay where I am had everything to do with what I sensed God wanted me to do. It didn't have anything to do with what could have made life better for me or what could have put more money in my pocket. Because I believe that my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And over the course of time, I've experienced God supplying my need and my family's need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You know, when there were, when there were issues and my son was dealing with some things that had happened that affected him negatively, and, you know, people get into talking about church people and what church people do, I said, son, remember, it's these same church people that paid their tithes and offerings, that paid our bills, that food on our table. These same church people that you've allowed people who left and spoke negatively of the ministry to speak into your ear. You listened to them and forgot to see the whole picture. And I do. I have to be careful that I don't allow bitterness to rise up in me. Uh, I can't allow a root of bitterness to rise up in me. I, I love y'all. I thank God for those of you all who are here. I understand the nature of people. That, good, that man came to Jesus and said, Good master. Jesus said, why, you, why do you call me good? There's nobody good but the Father. We have a sin nature. We're imperfect people. Imperfect people. And we have to operate as imperfect people. And I have to minister to you. Understand that I'm ministering to imperfect people who desire to do the will of the Lord. And who may make mistakes sometimes and decide to, to get caught up in self and get caught up in, in what really satisfy self. The Lord will give a word to bring us back in line. To remind us that this is not about us. This is about him. This is about his design. That we may not fully see, that we may not fully understand, but if we get into the scriptures and we study the scriptures, the Lord will speak to us. I believe the Lord is speaking to us this morning. He wouldn't have taken me here and given me this message if he wasn't speaking to us this morning. If you find yourself in this battle, that you're actively engaged in this battle between what you want and what God wants, I advise you to surrender to God because you won't win. You can save yourself a whole lot of headache and heartache and a lot of trouble down the road if you will say, yes, Lord. Yes to your will and yes to your way. So this morning, the, the invitation, the call is to those who want to say yes to the Lord, who want to surrender. Everybody knows their own situations. I don't have to have the spirit of discernment to look into you and tell you what you're going through and what you're doing. If the Lord gives me that and I do that, that's for your benefit. But you know you. Just like I know me. Where are you? Have you surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the starting point. To say yes to Jesus. You can't guide yourself. You don't have the wisdom to to guide yourself. You're talking to this person, that person, getting advice from here, getting advice from there, when you should be looking to God. But you have to position yourself in God to get the wisdom of God. 
positioning ourselves in God comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if there's one here, if there's somebody listening to us online, wherever you are, as we go to God in prayer this morning, search your heart. If you need to surrender to the Lord, or if you need to make a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, do that today. Don't let today pass you by without making that confession. Just, just bow your heads. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the reality of your word because it's so real in, in present-day life, in present-day situations. We find ourselves many times in this battle with what the Scripture calls the flesh and the spirit. But what we can recognize is a battle against our wills, our desires, and your design. Thank you for speaking to us from your word today, helping us to see that even though we might make a compromise that sounds good, it doesn't change your design. And you don't change your design for anyone. Thank you for being the sovereign God. Thank you for being the sovereign Lord. Thank you that it's only through you that we receive salvation. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. That is the name, the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross, for shedding your blood, for satisfying divine justice. Thank you, God, for your design to bring us to salvation. I pray now, if there is one, two, three, four, five, 10, 15, 20, and there are some who need you as Savior and Lord, I pray today that they will say yes to you. Even as they're praying in their hearts, I pray today that they will say yes to you and receive you as their Savior and their Lord. If there is a backslider, if there, is, if there are some who backslidden, who've been going their own way and doing their own thing, but you've spoken to them, you've caught their attention today, you spoke about your design that does not change. People are caught up in this battle right now. Deliver them. There's a believer that's caught up in this battle. Deliver that man. Deliver that woman. Deliver that child in the name of Jesus. They will yield their lives to you today. Come back to you in repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. As they pray, hear their prayer. Thank you, Father. Strengthen us and build us as we go forth from this place that our focus will be on your design and doing things your way, living our lives your way. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. If there is anyone today who, has, who, has, who needs to make a confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you're here, whether you're watching online, and you want to do this right now, I want to give you that opportunity to either come or pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. But I believe that you designed a way for me. That way is through Jesus Christ. His death, his burial, his resurrection, the shedding of his blood on the cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. As I yield myself to you, save me from my sin. I receive you now. I thank you for saving me. Amen. That's a simple prayer, but it's what the Lord has set in place. If that's the decision of your will to give your life to Jesus, because you asked him, he saved you. He died to save you. Because you asked him out of your will, not because I said the words. So if there's someone who wants to come today, come. If there's someone who's watching us online, put a comment in the, in the comment section. Someone is watching so that we can follow up with you. We want to start 
help you start this walk with the Lord. It's a lifelong journey. You start today. It's for a lifetime. Write to us and let us know of the decision that you've made. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Let's receive the benediction. So, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you that when your word goes forth, it does not return to you void. It accomplishes what you desire, all that you desire. And you prosper your word in the things that you sent your word to. Now as we prepare to depart from this place, you promise to be with us always. Never to leave us nor forsake us. Thank you for the promise of your word. Those of us who follow you, those of us who are your children, who abide under the shadow of your wings, we thank you for your divine protection. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you.